Hoffman uh, with us. Uh, he taught in the Department of Religious Studies uh, 2015 to 2016. And the talk this evening, I just want to mention, is uh, co-sponsored by the College of Arts and Letters, James Madison College, the College of Social Science, the Residential College of Arts and Humanities, the Office for Inclusion and Intercultural Affairs, the Department of Political Science, the Department of Religious Studies, and the Peace and Justice Program. So we have widespread support uh, across the university uh, for your talk. Rabbi Dr. Matthew Kaufman serves as the rabbi of Congregation Kilat Israel here in Lansing, and he has taught Jewish courses at MSU, as I mentioned. Before coming here, Rabbi Kaufman served a number of reform, conservative, and reconstructionist communities in the U.S. and Canada uh, since he received his ordination from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. He earned a PhD in humanities at York University in Toronto, where his studies focused on the relationship between science and religion. And he won several awards for his work, including the prestigious Ontario Graduate Scholarship Award. His work on Lowenstein uh, Wiener Fellow of the American Jewish Archives provided the basis for his PhD dissertation, which he then published with Syracuse University Press in 2019 under the title, Horace Callan Confronts America, Jewish Identity, Science and Secularism. His book is the first intellectual biography of the American Jewish philosopher who coined the term cultural pluralism and was hailed by the Jewish Review of Books as a revolutionary detailed account of a sorely neglected figure in the, um, in the history of American Jewish life. It explores the construction of Jewish identity in light of scientific culture and print culture, and it draws extensively on archival material that traces how Callan, in the process of working out his American Jewish identity, transformed American Jewish life and America along the way. His articles have appeared in American Jewish History, Saigon Journal of Religion and Science, Shofar, an interdisciplinary journal of Jewish studies, and the New School's public seminar. He is currently under contract with Bloomsbury Press to write a chapter for the cultural history of the Bible series. I know that um, Robert Matthew Kaufman gave a talk sponsored by the Sterling Institute uh, several years ago at MSU. Uh, in, in the process of writing the book that has been published since, and it was uh, fascinating then, and the subject is so timely important today. So we really look forward to hearing from you. Um, uh, Rabbi Kaufman, um, Dr. and Rabbi Matthew Kaufman uh, will talk for about 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll open it up uh, to questions. So please feel free to uh, write your questions in the Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Professor Aronoff. And thanks as well to the Serling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel and this very long list of co-sponsors for making this event possible. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. In December, ABC News reported that the word unprecedented had been named People's Choice 2020 year of the wor Word of the Year by Dictionary.com. It even beat out the word pandemic. The profligate use of the word underscores how difficult it has been to adequately capture the dizzying array of crises that have engulfed our lives and challenged our understanding of how democracy is supposed to function. There is at least one clear persistent challenge that emerges from this chaos that we have been living through. And that is the challenge of finding common ground to cooperate. This challenge is arguably the central theme of 2021. It asks of us the hard question, if it is still possible to create a society that is characterized by the spirit of cooperation. There is much reason to be pessimistic, but President Biden and Vice President Harris believe that it is possible and we may shortly begin to see if they are right. This question of cooperation will occupy us tonight as we explore the thought of American Jewish philosopher, Horace Meyer Callan, who lived from 1882 to 1974. Callan is most famous for having coined the term cultural pluralism, a forerunner to what would later be called multiculturalism. According to Callan, democracy's survival depends on cooperation. We're gonna take a close look at his ideas and their rootedness in his Jewish experience. And we will ask ourselves if his unflagging faith in American democracy is hopelessly romantic or if it contains some meaningful inspiration. 
Some of the upheavals that we are experiencing now have their echo in what Callan experienced a century ago. The America that Callan struggled with in the 1910s and 1920s was an America that saw the rise of xenophobia, anti-immigration sentiment and legislation, and the political ascendancy of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1924, when a stringent anti-immigration act was signed into law, he authored the book in which the term cultural pluralism appeared for the first time in print. This is it. Oh, I'm seeing on my screen, um, yeah, Elle's uh, picture um, front, uh, is actually occupying the screen. I'm not sure, I'm hoping that, that, uh, that my tile is, is the one that's visible. Um, Who's this? Okay, um, so it's called Culture and Democracy in the United States. In this book, he makes the claim that America had to choose between the KKK and democracy. Given the prominence of far-right groups in American politics today, it strikes me that America faces a similar choice now. Another work that Callan wrote is the theological political tractate, provocatively entitled, you can see it, Secularism is the Will of God, which appeared just at the end of the McCarthy era in American politics. In it, he discussed the need to counter fascistic tendencies in American culture another point of connection with today's issues. When I first began reading and writing about Callan's efforts to promote cultural diversity and an open and democratic society in America, I could not have anticipated that it would have such contemporary resonance. In my book, Horace Callan Confronts America, the first intellectual biography of Horace Callan, I explore what seems almost paradoxical at first blush. I tell the story of a Jew who rejects Judaism, but embraces religion while remaining committedly Jewish. I tell the story of a man who believed in secularism with the faith and fervor of an apostle. Indeed, he said of himself that he was not a Judaist, but a secularist. Secularism was his religion. Horace Cowan arrived in America from Germany in 1887 when he was five years old. He attended Harvard, and among his teachers were two who particularly shaped their young and argumentative pupil, American literary scholar Barrett Wendell and philosopher and psychologist William James. These two thinkers helped shape Callan's budding identity as a Jewish American, in some ways even more than did his father, an Orthodox rabbi, from whom he felt alienated because of his harsh authoritarian style. From Wendell, he learned to see Puritan heritage as connected to his Jewish heritage. And from James, he learned to embrace the difference that he experienced living as a Jew in America. Callan was also a founder of the New School for Social Research in 1919. He shaped that school's core commitment to pluralism and taught his last course there in the fall of 1973 at the age of 91. He authored some 40 books and more than 400 articles and pamphlets. Throughout his voluminous output, Callan's primary concern was freedom and virtually everything he wrote addresses that topic. He was not quite 70 years old in 1951 when he wrote a pamphlet called Democracy's True Religion, which made the case for considering American democracy to be a religion. Now this article really got under the skin of sociologist Will Herberg, author of Protestant Catholic Jew. Callan bothered him because he argued that there is such a thing as American religion that is secular in nature. To Herberg, secular religion was a contradiction in terms, but for Callan, American religion was real. Here's what Callan writes in Democracy's True Religion. Believers in democracy bet their lives on a way of living. This way assures that human society is an open society where the entire miscellany of mankind may enter freely and live and move and have their beings in safety, all equally at liberty to unite themselves with their fellows or to abandon one union and join another. 
To bet one's life on democracy is to rely on it as the surest guarantee of union and freedom, even if the facts on the ground might lead one to despair of that. The believer nevertheless still chooses to have faith in the willingness of all to assure each other equal liberty. He continues, for the communicants of the democratic faith, this is the religion of religions. The common faith in the way of life which keeps impartial peace among them all and assures to each its liberty on equal terms with the others. It is the one way in which each, although maintaining its unique and singular individuality, although cherishing its incommensurable difference, can yet live together with the others in such wise that it can grow in liberty and safety more certainly than if it sought to exist solo. Because democracy depends on the cooperation of the different, the commitment to it constitutes an act of faith that such a cooperation will result in the enhancement of life, liberty, and happiness for all. And because it guarantees to each religion the right to freely live, that makes it, for Callan, the religion of religions. Another name for this, he writes, is secularism. Secularism embraces the democratic method to create an open space into which all religions can come together as equals. Thus, secularism is religion. It is the religion of freedom of religion, opening space for diverse beliefs and theologies. I mentioned earlier that Will Herberg was immensely provoked by Callan. He dismissed Callan's faith as not a faith at all since it has no basis in revelation and it has no metaphysics that posits belief in God. But Callan's ideas were not so outlandish as all that, it seems, because in 1967, sociologist Robert Bella would become famous for an article describing American civil religion, which sounds an awful lot like what Callan had written about 16 years earlier. A number of scholars have argued that the construction of American civil religion, such as that confessed by John Dewey in his 1934, A Common Faith, or analyzed by Robert Bella in his 1967, Civil Religion in America, developed out of the Protestant background of the authors. In this context, it's important to understand Callan's construction of secularism as a Jewish intervention in American civil religion. Callan's commitment to secularism as the religion of religions sprang from his Jewish experience. It is not that secularism is inherently Jewish, it's that Callan approached it and fleshed it out as a Jew who struggled with how to be fully American, fully Jewish, and fully included. Secularism was also Callan's prescription to solve Jewish disunion. He believed that a secularist orientation would create peace within a fractured Jewish community with its different religious groupings unable to cooperate with each other and its secular groups entirely segregated from Jewish religious denominational life and education. In fact, Callan hoped to make the Jewish community a kind of test case for his American vision. He hoped to influence the Jewish community's educational system to embrace the principled openness that secularism offers. He wanted the Jewish community to adopt the democratic method to bring together all of the varied aspects of Jewish life, religious and otherwise, into one integrated whole. Although Callan was an influential voice in Jewish education and from let's say the 1940s on, the Association for American Jewish Education embraced more pluralism than had hitherto prevailed. It never went as far as Callan envisioned it should. The sense of urgency that Callan felt in his mission to proselytize secularism to the Jewish community was rooted in his belief that the achievement of full equality by Jews in American society could not depend solely on the normalization of Jewish modes of worship. It was not religious Judaism that needed to be accepted. It was Jews as Jews. Moreover, in the context of the early 20th century, when he first formulated his ideas, he believed 
that Judaism itself would become increasingly irrelevant to the lives of Jews so long as it resisted the forces of science and secularization, which to him represented modernity. From about 1918, he began to argue explicitly that all solutions to the Jewish problem, so to speak, in America, depended on the secularization of the Jewish community. Callan's secularism, you'll recall, is not an anti-religious position. As he saw it, it clears space for an open understanding of Jewish identity and creates the conditions for the orchestration of all the diverse and diversifying meanings of the term Jew. This orchestration of diversity is what Callan's cultural pluralism means. Cultural pluralism grounds a healthy democratic process and should guide our understanding of what it means to be American. This principle applies not only to American society as a whole, but also to its constituent diversities, like Jews, who themselves exhibit their own diversities. Callan's commitment to secularism is connected to his commitment to Jewish identity. He renewed his Jewish spirit through secularism, not through Judaism. One scholar I recently corresponded with expressed his frustration with the trend that scholars like me write about Callan through the lens of Jewish studies. To him, it is clear that what is primary in Callan's thought is America, not Judaism. It's a tough thing to measure though. What I find is that the two are inseparable in Callan's thought. His thoughts on America are Jewish thoughts and his thoughts on Judaism I should say Hebraism, for that was his preferred term, are American. He inhabited the hyphen in Jewish hyphen American. Secularism is the hyphen linking together his Jewish and American identity. The aim of the secularist faith is to create a foundation for fostering the union of differing groups, especially in the face of adversity. The disjunction between the ideal of the union of the different and the actual relationships is what secularism aims to address. Rather than accept the idea of the war of all against all as the natural and inevitable state of affairs, secularism understands that to be a choice that understands that to be a choice that people make out of fear. Another relational pattern that can be chosen is live and let live, live and help live, subverting the war of all against all toward peace. This is a choice made out of love, he writes, a love which acts to conserve, to multiply, to vary, to strengthen and enhance otherness instead of nullifying otherness. In this secular sense, Callan explains, secularism is God's love, reordering evils into goods. If secularism is the name for the faith, he writes, then democracy is the name for the works by which the love of mankind is executed as the will of God. Now I want to let Horace Callan himself speak about his secularist faith. This is from a popular radio broadcast series called This I Believe. It aired in 1953. This I believe. Dr. Horace M. Callan describes himself as a man who lives his life in philosophy and makes his living by teaching it. He has been on the faculty of New York's New School for Social Research ever since its founding and is at present dean of its graduate faculty and chairman of the Department of Philosophy and Psychology. This is Dr. Callan's creed. The beliefs by which I live followed from an inner debate begun when I first read the Book of Job in English. I had known it only in Hebrew. There's a verse in the 13th chapter, which literally translated, would read, Lo, he will slay me, I shall not survive, nevertheless will I maintain my ways before him. But the King James Version starts this as, Though he slay me, will I trust in him? I could not, for the life of me, reconcile the contradiction. But in time I realized that the irreconcilable versions were due to the differences between the beliefs and their makers. That the versions could contradict each other precisely because they are not statements of fact, but expressions of attitudes. Ever since, 
I have held that we all live by faith, live so because we must, not because we wish. Our existence is the workings of personal beliefs, which are the present substance of the goods we hope for, the present evidence of the goods we do not see. Thus each of us lives as an act of faith, as an attitude toward change and chance and necessity. Naturally, there must be more beliefs and more diverse beliefs than there are people. This is why what people believe in matters less than how they believe in it for how they believe witnesses the quality of their devotion to what? Very many beliefs are but expedients of struggle and adjustment, but the basic ones are the few on which the believer bets his life. You bet your life on some what? When you freely work for it, fight for it, and if needs must, die for it. Now, in my 70th year, I am asked, what have I bet my life on? pondering the answer, I find that above all else I believe in equal liberty for every person to believe, to change his beliefs, to tell his beliefs, and in reason as the one method by which this equality of all believers is most reliably confirmed and advanced. I believe that democracy is the free orchestration of mankind's equal liberty, that progress is their teamwork that peace is their reciprocal guarantees. I believe in reason as that which orchestration, progress, and peace consum it, and I believe in this consummation as the common goal for all who learn as I have learned, that whoever claims freedom to choose his own faith must grant his neighbors equal freedom to choose. I believe that such reciprocity renders each person a contributor to collective security for the equal liberty of every person. True, mankind are everywhere more disposed to secure their own freedoms by attacking others. The world George Santayano observed is full of conscript minds. Only they are in different armies and nobody is fighting to be free, but each to make his own conscription universal. Now to bet one's life on equal liberty for everybody as the goal and on reason as the going to this goal is to enlist in a lasting war against all such conscriptions. It is to live by a fighting faith in the freedom which Job bet his life on when he challenged the justice of the Almighty and the Almighty justified him. There are the beliefs of Dr. Horace M. Callan of New York. He is a distinguished scholar and author. Callan's belief in one equal liberty for every person to believe change his beliefs and tell his beliefs two in reason and three in democracy is grounded in pragmatist philosophy in the vein of william james james to claim for this pragmatic belief religious sanction is not without its problems since it is a religion with no object of belief. Belief for Callan is important not because of what you believe in, but how you believe in it. Now, for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, for example, this may not be entirely acceptable. These religions make certain claims about the nature of ultimate reality. Many hold that these clearly stake out a position that the object of religion matters. It isn't enough to just talk about the function of religion, many would argue that the God of revelation and the content of that revelation matter. This is fair criticism. Nevertheless, as philosopher Richard Bernstein argues, the insights of the pragmatic thinkers ought to be integrated in, into any reflective conception of the religious life. Because the pragmatic approach to religious thought and experience has the potential to infuse a principled, pragmatic tolerance, openness, and critical fallibilism into a broad range of religious convictions. Both Richard Bernstein and Hilary Putnam have offered sketches of what a pragmatic approach to religious thought looks like. Their insights apply equally as well to Horace Callan as they do to John Dewey, Edward Scribner Ames, and William James. A key principle is the rejection of the notion of absolute truth and certainty. To the pragmatists, 
Knowledge is a process of continuous critical inquiry that is subject to validation through experiment. Since no religion may claim absolute truth and certainty for itself over and against any other religion, it is necessary to adopt a pluralist outlook wherein people engage in productive critical encounters with other points of view. Pragmatists are pluralists committed to the principles of communication and experiment. They're committed to a democratic outlook and are suspicious of any dogmatism. These core commitments lead them to focus on the pragmatic implications of religious salvational aspirations. Callan understands these aspirations, whatever form they take, to be concerned with future consequences. Because secularism expresses faith in the future success of democratic cooperation, it is a salvational scheme. It seeks to orchestrate conditions in the present such that it brings about the desired future consequences of freedom and life more abundant for all. Callan explicitly affirmed it as an article of faith in 1965 in Secularism is the Common Religion of a Free Society, uh, when he wrote, the this worldly religions with their sciences of nature and man, the otherworldly ones with their otherworldly disciplines are like professions of faith as St. Paul defines faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The secularist attitude in religion, Callan adds, is quintessentially American and fundamental to what the abolitionist Theodore Parker named the American idea in Boston's Faneuil Hall in 1850. The American idea, Parker said, affirms that all men are created equal, have unalienable rights, and the democratic government should be established to develop these rights. It is the idea of freedom, he said, boldly juxtaposing that against the idea of slavery. As Callan understood it, the American idea is specifically the national religion. To be sure, the uneven commitment to, and indeed the not infrequent undermining of that idea in American law and politics makes of it an article of faith rather than a description of reality, but not a naive faith. As Callan describes it, it, it is a religion that demands of its communicants that they confront the various social evils as they present themselves. This type of pragmatic faith, Richard Bernstein writes, helps to clarify the concrete meaning of religious life because it requires persistence, courage, imagination, and active responsibility in confronting social evils. The extent to which Callan succeeds or fails in clarifying the concrete meaning of religious life is a fate he shares in common with other pragmatists like John Dewey. And it is a fate bound up more broadly with how religious discourse engages with civil religion. I've heard it suggested that in setting up secularism as the American religion, Callan himself violates the doctrine of separation of church and state. But as Callan saw it, precisely the opposite is the case. This is how he understands the matter. The separation of church and state is the most reliable insurance of the equal liberty for all faiths and equal security for all churches. One development from this separation has been the growing importance of the social gospel in the climate of opinion due to the democratic intention. Another has been the trend to interfaith cooperation. A third has been the formation from the church's manifold diversity of the idea of God and his will of a new single idea comprehending the equal rights of each unit of the multitude. In sum, the acknowledgement that secularism is the will of God follows from the separation of church and state and is intrinsic to the American way in religion. Callan's secularism constitutes a Jewish contribution to the discourse of civil religion, but until now, he has not been recognized for his contribution. The rich body of scholarly literature concerning civil religion contains virtually no reference to Callan at all. This was painful for him, as he confided in 1967 to his dear friend, Ira Eisenstein, a founder of Reconstructionist Judaism. 
he wrote to him, Dear Ira, your editorial on civil religion in America prompts this note, which is for you and not for publication because I'm afraid that my perhaps unwarranted feelings of being at once used and disregarded are also in play. I don't read Daedalus and have no personal idea of what Bella has written, but what he calls civil religion is what I have over a generation called secularism. And I have discussed it in pamphlets, articles, and books, such as democracy's true religion and secularism is the will of God. I even designed a Bible of America, a collection of expressions by poets, statesmen, politicians, and others, starting from the Declaration of Independence and culminating with FDR's Four Freedoms. Publishers to whom I offered it refused it as unprofitable. Please forgive my addressing my discontent and forget it. Eisenstein responded, I think you're quite justified in your complaints. We too have been talking about faith of America ever since we published the book some years ago. Very few people have taken up the idea and every once in a while someone comes along with the same idea and does not credit anybody else. What Eisenstein is, is talking about uh, is a book put out by the Reconstructionist Press in 1951 called Faith of America, an anthology of readings, songs, and prayers for all of the American holidays. It was the first of its kind, a liturgy expressly intended to celebrate the American democratic faith. As Eisenstein well understood, its resonance with secularism was deep and profound. For this reason, he's able to commiserate with Callan about Bella's disconcerting omission. Callan's conception of the American idea as American civil religion is perhaps the single most robust formulation from that time. Its singularity, he wrote, is signaled through the famous maximum e pluribus unum, which Callan insisted does not properly mean out of many, one. It cannot mean homogeneity, he said. When the Declaration of Independence tells us that all men are created equal, it did not intend to say that we are all the same, but rather that our differences are of equal value. E pluribus unum is the ideal of union achieved by cooperating to protect and to treasure our cultural, religious, sexual, and other differences. It insists on the natural right of difference. It is a commitment to value differences equally. It does not mean to erase differences into one homogenous point of view. This understanding was echoed more recently by renowned educator James Banks, who wrote in 1997, that an unum is authentic and legitimate within a democratic pluralistic society only when the diverse racial, ethnic, cultural, social class and gender groups within the nation state are participating fully in its construction and reconstruction and are helping to, to determine its aims, goals and values. As a religious ideal, it found its echo in the thought of Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, founder of Reconstructionist Judaism. In his 1937, The Meaning of God in Modern Jewish Religion, Kaplan referred to God as the power that makes for cooperation. Callan went so far as to propose the creation of a secular Bible. He called it the Bible of America. This Bible would contain the secular equivalent to the Pentateuch, the prophetic books, and the poetic and wisdom writings. This is what he writes in 1956 in Cultural Pluralism and the American Idea. Its book of Genesis would of course be the Declaration of Independence, which is also the simplest, clearest, most comprehensive, yet briefest telling of the American idea. It sets the theme and whatever follows is a variation upon it. He goes on to suggest over 30 other possible texts, including speeches, literature, and laws that variously address historic and social justice issues such as slavery, racial discrimination, women's rights and labor relations, as well as more general principles of human rights, democracy, and the separation of church and state. And the Bible might conclude in unfinished political Torah with the universal declaration of human rights adopted by the assembly of the United Nations. This Torah, as he calls it, would thus express the values and ideals of freedom and democracy. The use of the word Torah here gestures at how he frames American civil religion from his own Jewish experience. 
He had written decades earlier that Torah should be understood to be a changing thing, acquiring new texts and teachings, and that, quote, economic and social democracy are the chief concern of the prophets, are the objective of the legislation of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and the intent of the living law of the people as recorded in the Talmud, unquote. So that calling the UN Declaration of Human Rights political Torah suggests that he saw himself as writing Torah, even now. Indeed, to put a fine point on it, he included in the list of possible texts one of his own essays. Now we've seen that for Callan, for this American idea to be viable, the ethos of what he describes as the secularist idea must prevail, which postulates an ethic of equal liberty and of union as collective guarantee of equal liberty. The question for our time, living as we are during what has been called the tribalization of American politics is whether all of this talk about orchestration and cooperation resonates as meaningful or rings as hollow. I suspect that if Callan were alive today, he would still be advocating for his vision because he lived through times not so very different from ours. He wrote these ideas in the wake of the jingoistic patriotism and xenophobia of the First World War era. He wrote them when the Ku Klux Klan was a dominant political force in the 1920s. And it was during the fascistic threat of the McCarthy era that he published Democracy's True Religion, which argued for pluralism and tolerance as basic ideas, basic principles of the American idea. Now it's possible that Callan's romantic view of democracy is fatally flawed by his basic assumption that we're rational actors making educated and rational decisions. We've seen that all too many Americans have proven immune to facts, vaccinated against them by echo chambers created by social media and other sources of propaganda. Callan has been criticized for failing to recognize the deep structural inequities of power, for failing to recognize what we today call structural racism, which prevents ethnic and racial minorities from achieving full socioeconomic parity. Perhaps too naively, he had faith that ethnic and racial minorities would eventually succeed at improving their situations all by themselves. This is fair criticism. In fact, Callan did not advance any kind of theory for dismantling the power structures that perpetuate inequities. So there were some blind spots that if they were not created by Callan's religious faith were nevertheless exacerbated by his faith. The Vietnam War is a prime example of this. In 1966, Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote to Callan requesting that he sign onto a statement condemning the Vietnam War. He was trying to collect the signatures of 30 or 40 important Jewish figures and Callan was among them. The statement expresses being gravely troubled about the morality of our involvement in the war. A key sentence in, this, in the uh, statement reads, it's, uh, it's the last sentence in there. If morality commands some wars, it most certainly forbids others. And it is clear to us that the Vietnam War is one of the latter. Now you can see in the text there on the screen that Callan marked that, that sentence for his response with a large X. Now one might have expected Callan to have signed on to this statement, which condemns supporting a despotic military oligarchy that oppressed the people it governed. But in 1966, Callan sided with the American government's position on this. He saw the war as morally justified. This is how he responded in September, 1966 the same month in which the largest draft call of the Vietnam War was announced. I interpret our country's role, our government's role, both at home and abroad, as a continuation of the civil war for the abolition of human slavery. During that war, there were also numbers of Americans who sympathized with the Confederacy and did all they could to frustrate Abraham Lincoln's draft and to end the war. They were called copperheads. I ask you to reflect how much copperheadism there may not be in the protestations and obstructions against the basic role of our United States in the ongoing struggle for equal liberty and equal safety among all mankind. Now, it might be the case that Callan's understanding of what was happening in Vietnam was colored by the first elections held in South Vietnam since the military regime was installed, held just a week prior. It may have looked to him like democracy was making headway. But Callan's faith in democracy seems to have encouraged him 
to interpret the US government's actions as being motivated by the idealistic commitment to human freedom that he felt it should have. So here too, we may critique his faith as misplaced, perhaps suggesting that the democratic faith leads to self-delusion. Maybe this is the sad lesson of Kalenian civil religion applied to our day. On the other hand, we have witnessed the inauguration of a new president who promises to restore the soul of America. President Biden and Vice President Harris regularly appeal for national unity based on empathy and respect for one another. Here, I think Callan has an important corrective to offer. He argued that it isn't unity, but union we should be striving for. Unity is hom homogenous and erases difference. Union preserves multiple perspective takings. It's an important distinction to bear in mind and one which was suggested, in fact, by Amanda Gorman's moving performance at the inauguration of her stirring poem, The Hill We Climb, when she told us that, we are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. Will this new leadership embrace a Kalenian vision of cooperative democracy rooted in empathy and mutual support? Is it possible to build something approaching union from this current state of affairs? Kennedy's famous line, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country is in keeping with the demands that Callan holds freedom makes upon us. Freedom is not terribly special when it is just about individual freedoms. The idea that we should all be free to do what we like may be a kind of universal value, but it is not in Callan's view, a democratic value. What makes freedom of value in the American democratic religion, as Callan envisions it, is not so much freedom from interference, but freedom to live to the fullest by means of helping others to live their lives to the fullest. Now, key to Callan's faith in democracy is the conviction that it is not an unreasonable faith. It's a pragmatic faith that builds on what he sees as elements of progress, promising salvational potential, but only conditionally, not inevitably. It's a faith he chooses despite America's failure to live up to its promise. And here's how he saw the matter in 1933. It seems to me to apply equally well to today. He wrote, when the spirit of liberty arose in the United States, it arose also to break bonds. But what it desired was not destroyed. What it shattered, it failed to make powerless. For the most part, the free individual remained an ideal, a program, not an accomplishment. Its fulfillment, even its very existence as an ideal, has been menaced by established interests, by greed, by ignorance, by intolerance. The whole history of freedom in the United States is a history of unremitting warfare against American-born enemies of its very right to exist. Today, her champions have grown weary. They have lost hope. They have lost faith. Their courage fails them. He goes on to argue that Americans should continue to keep up the fight for the America he believes in is still worth fighting for. This passage references the free individual. Callan critiqued the toxic individualism that he saw in America and which I suspect is still with us today. Why has individualism come to grief? Why has democracy failed, he asked in 1933. The answer is, that individualism came to grief because it was not actually individualism at all, because it was actually a negation of collectivism, not an affirmation of individuality. To let men be is one thing. To seek their enlargement in life, liberty, and happiness is altogether another. The answer is that democracy has not failed because democracy has not yet had a free chance to make good. Freedom is a value only because it is meant to enhance our lives. To put it in terms that speak directly to our times, I'm gonna play a short clip now of an interview with a freedom-loving individualist anti-masker. Some of you may be familiar with Jordan Klepper from the Trevor Noah Social Distancing Show. Why aren't you wearing a mask? I mean, again, it's a personal choice, I think. If everybody was wearing them and everybody said put a mask on, I would respect everybody's wishes and put it on. Uh -huh. We're not cheap. We're you're not lines. cheap. You're not cheap. But if everybody here was wearing masks. If everybody was wearing but again, we're not cheap. You're not cheap. We're not. So you're going to look at what everybody's doing and you're going to follow That's along. That's it. Yeah. yeah. 
this man's delicious unawareness of his own contradiction really sharpens the point that he is not the standard bearer for individualism. Those who refuse to wear masks proclaim through bullhorns their proud stance for individualism and freedom. But freedom to not wear a mask is a freedom without purpose or value. Anti-mask militancy brings individualism and democracy to grief because it is a negation of their value. Individualism and democracy require a sense of connectedness, social responsibility, and a mutual commitment to supporting the right of all to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At the beginning of this talk, I said that if nothing else, the experiences of this last year force us to reckon with whether or not it is still possible to create a society and a community of nations indeed that is characterized by the spirit of cooperation and the idea of a shared collective destiny. Even as Horace Callan developed the idea in his thesis of cultural pluralism and the religion of democracy, it remained an unrealized ideal in his time just as much as ours, but he nevertheless placed his faith in it. Secularism gave expression to the ideals by which he bet his life. I wonder how this speaks to us today. I wonder if the evidence of our time has revealed Callan's faith orientation to be romantic fantasy, or if there is still room for a pragmatic secularist faith that American democracy may yet become a union of the different. Thank you. Thank you so much for a thought provoking and also inspiring uh, talk. So please uh, do put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I see there's a question from Annette Weinschenk in the q and I don't know if you'd like to, um, you know, uh, for us to make visible um, those, those who ask the questions or not, uh, but if you can uh, read it, uh, uh, Rabbi and Dr. Uh, Kaufman, um, you right. can you can see how you'd like to respond. Yeah. Right. Um, so the question is, how would Callan respond to um, the left's embrace of cancel culture, identity politics, preferred victimhood, approved speech, and anti-Semitism? Well, you know, I, I think that what what Callan um, would say is that. Um, oxygenation of conflict um, can be productive, that airing all these differences um, is actually a mark of a healthy society with, when we have, um, when we have um, you know, even outrage being expressed, there's a place for it. Um, I think though that he would, he would suggest that the censorship, that the actual, you know, the process of the cancel culture, like actually canceling somebody, I think he would have a problem with that um, in the sense that, uh, it, I mean, I, how do I, how do I, how do I put it? I saw an episode of, um, what is this, Fran, uh, Fran Leibowitz, is that the, um, I, I'm trying to remember the, um, the show on Netflix now, um, but uh, she was asked, um, uh, you know, would she listen to, you know, um, I, like, let's take, let's take any example, like um, a Wagner, you know, because we know how bad Wagner was, uh, should we cancel him, therefore not listen to his music? And her answer was, I'll listen to his music. What he did was horrible. So, you know, the, the idea of the art then being subjected to being canceled uh, is problematic. And I think Callan would agree um, with that, that you need to address and, and sanction those who are, are creating a problem uh, and, who, um, and who, who really need to be dressed down. Um, but, uh, but he would wanna make sure that along the way we were supporting each other and not silencing the voices of opposition. Um, as far as uh, anti-Semitism is concerned, I think he would have been a very vocal, um, vocal, uh, you know, um, advocate, you know, for um, for civil discourse, and to say that this kind of discourse has no has no place, in, you know, that this kind of an outlook has no place in um, in American politics and law, um, and it needs to be opposed. Uh, I see another question: Did Callan think secular? Uh, this is from this is from my my uh, supervisor. 
uh, Bernie Lightman, uh, my PhD supervisor. So I uh, got to read this question very carefully. Um, did Callan think secular democracy was appropriate only for the United States? Or did he think it could provide a model for any nation, even if dominated by religions not part of the Abrahamic tradition? In other words, according to Callan, is America unique in being a possible site for the realization of secular democracy? Um, <clears throat> so Callan, um, Callan believed that America was unique as a, as a possible site for the realization of secular democracy. And he believed um, in exporting this American idea uh, to the world. And he believed that Israel um, could adopt, should adopt this American idea as well. Um, that for example, to take the case of Israel, um, he said that it was an issue, um, the, um, the militarization um, of, of Israel um, and, and its, its oppression of Palestinians um, was a negation of the, what he called at that time, the Jewish idea, which was the same thing as the American idea, that Israel needed to take a chance and have faith that, um, that, uh, that its democratic ideals would prevail um, and, trust that, and trust in that future rather than try to um, rely on force um, and violence to secure um, its existence. Um, he believed that, the, that this democratic um, method uh, should be adopted around the world, that it was, it was the source really um, for, it was the only guarantee for mutual peace between the nations. This idea of course developed after World War II when, when we developed the idea that, that nation states had a natural right to exist and we had, we had these defined boundaries. So some of it comes out of that. So it was very cosmopolitan in outlook. Um, and he felt that it was a, a vision that the whole world uh, should rightly uh, adopt uh, if they wanted to have, um, if, if the world is to have a, have a, a, a chance at peace and mutual guarantee of security. I don't know if you'd like me to read the question or if you prefer, but the next question is from Kirsten from English. If you'd like to, you're also um, welcome to uh, be unmuted and ask the question, Kirsten. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see the, didn't see it. Now I'm seeing it, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, she, uh, so she writes, I'll read it aloud. Um, I think she's coming on now. I oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I actually was thinking, sorry, I was thinking you would read it and I was saying, no, 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 I want you to read it, but- Oh, um, sorry, go ahead yeah, and read okay, it. I can ask it, it's okay. Thank you so much for the talk, um, Rabbi Matthew, it was great. Um, I was wondering if you would be, um, uh, if you might talk a little bit more about whether his work changes over time. It's like a long span. It's like uh, his his work seems to span a really long time frame of 40 years. And I was really actually interested in how the Cold War might have shaped things, especially because like uh, secularism becomes really demonized during the Cold War. And I'm wondering how that affected his use of the term and other people's responses to the term. So, um he kind of doubled down uh, because of the Cold War. Um, the, his articulation of secularism as a religion happened during the Cold War. It was, um, but it was, a con it was continuous with, it didn't represent a, a break from, but it was continuous with um, the arc of his thought over the previous decades. Um, these are ideas that, that he began to develop around cooperation that he developed in um, consumerism, his book about consumerism. Um, and uh, in terms of how the Cold War might have affected his work, um, not only did he double down on it, um, I think it was also sort of a cri de coeur to America to stand up against McCarthyism. Um, and to evoke in all the more the, you know, this, this uh, idea of cooperation um, and tolerance um, and, and, and multiple perspective taking. Um, in terms of communism and secular, uh, communism and socialism, he had, yeah, in fact, a little side note, um, he was um, placed on the 
the naughty list um, by McCarthy uh, at one point, and uh, and it, and his name was finally just removed by by intervention from a from a close friend of his. There, there's um, one more question there from Nona Calkins on what role public education um, has in promoting secularism. And since there are no um, additional questions yet, um, please write them down. If you have any, I'll uh, ask a question in addition to what can be done to promote secularism uh, in public education is, uh, I don't know if you can elaborate more on whether he thought there might be kind of competing um, perceptions of civic religion uh, in the United States, that one might be the one that you portrayed as embracing kind of pragmatism and um, cultural pluralism and, and the embrace of diversity but uh, and different religions. The other may be possibly I'll throw out there um, as devil's advocate, kind of a more Christian um, a civic religion that's embedded, you know, the secular, the secularism in America is more of a Christian uh, sector as I'm posing this as to what he would say to this, where, where you have in the public realm uh, uh, so much uh, of uh, Christianity in different ways and then the rituals of inaugurations of all presidents going to church on Monday mornings and the, et cetera. Like, you know, did he see kind of com competing perceptions of what American civic religion is? I think that, that um, he, I think that the idea of um, jingoistic um, civil religion was one that he didn't have any patience with. So the, the worship of American institutions or the flag, um, that, was, that to him would have been fetishism. Um, so um, in terms of um, other articulations of American civil religion that maybe were manifest through particular um, religious and other religious denominations, um, he would he would have said that those uh, diff that those would be entirely consistent with his view that that there should be no one view about the civil religion, right? That that this is all about multiple perspective taking, so that um, uh, as he put it in secularism is the will of God. Um, Sec that this secularism affirms the God of all of the different faiths without have, without taking a particular stand itself, uh, you know, on its own. Um, so um, yeah, uh, Yael, there was more to the question you asked. So can you please um, flag it for me one more time? No, I, I think that, that that kind of answers it. And maybe part of the answer as you express is he's often talking about the ideals of certain interpretations where you know someone else might interpret Amer a, a secular American civic religion as kind of very much influenced by the culture of Christianity of the dominant group in the country, and therefore, right. you know, and those not, aren't necessarily competing; they can be complementary, as the way he portrays it. But I'm wondering to what extent he ever um, dealt with the. Um, the suggestion that at times that they are competing. And then I also didn't want you to forget about that other question about promoting um, secularism through public education that was in the right. q and uh, Nona. Yes. I'm gonna, oh, yeah, I, I haven't forgotten you, Nona. I'll get to you. Um, so yes, the, um, um, I think that as far as, um, if civil religion were being sort of co-opted to serve one particular vested, group's interest. Um, and we've seen, for example, that um, when, you know, we talk about Judeo-Christian dialogue, or not, sorry, not dialogue, um, Judeo-Christian culture, um, or Judeo-Christian view in America. That, in, in, when Callan was writing in the 1950s, sort of the Judeo-Christian discourse represented that kind of, well, sort of a pluralist approach. But, but Judeo-Christian discourse has shifted, you know, it's, it's on the right now. And, it, 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 and when people talk about Judeo-Christian values, that's the word I was looking for. My brain wasn't working right. Judeo-Christian values, what they really are, what, these are words that are being used really by sort of a right wing, um, uh, fundamentalist sort of Christian uh, group. Um, so they're using language that is 
universal or pluralistic sounding, but in fact, it just represents a parochial point of view. Um, I think he would very much object uh, to that and, um, and suggest that uh, we need to be on guard against the idea of people using the vocabulary of something that applies, you know, is something that is universal, but is in fact representative of only the vested interest of, um, of one group. Um, Nona asked, what is the role of public education in promoting secularism? Okay, so um, this, he, he, he understands that education is the, um, first of all, he says that, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna read to you, one of the innovations he says in, about separation of church and state is the development of public education in harmony with the principle of separation. Um, he writes, I'm just skimming, um, that in the education of youth, uh, of youth, which separation intends and in no small degree achieves is to have the nation's children grow up ready to join with their fellow citizens of all persuasions and sorts and conditions in the common faith in the, com in the American idea and the common following on the American way. They can be so readied only as they are saved from the isolationism of creedal indoctrination and denominational hatreds and have learned that loyalty to a whole, which is a union of its parts, is loyalty to the assurance of the equal liberty and safety of each of the parts. That loyalty to this assurance calls for the reasoned vigilance, which is the price of liberty and the thoughtful curiosity, which is the condition of safety. So yeah, um, public education um, is absolutely critical um, to train young minds um, to become productive citizens and to be pluralists, right? To, have, to maintain pers multiple perspective taking. So he would very much oppose, you know, creationism in schools um, and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that he, he insists that separation of church and state is, is critical in the public schools in order to promote this secular ideal. We invite more questions. Um, I know you're you're tackling kind of very conflict complex concepts here, but if anybody else has questions, please don't hesitate. Um, or if you choose also, um, Dr. Kaufman to and Rabbi Kaufman to, um, if you'd like to elaborate on kind of analogies to the present, because I know you ended with a powerful uh, kind of commentary on what he might have to say. Um, today and kind of uh, with some hope in terms of the, the new administration that you pointed out. Um, but I don't know if you might elaborate, elaborate on, on kind of what he, you know. Well, you know, the reality is, is he, you know, in some ways he was, he was a fundamentalist for this, this faith. I mean, that really, you know, he was, he was committed. That's fine. He was committed. Um, and as I mentioned, it blinded him in some ways to what even was going on around him in Vietnam. And it led him, it led him to take a stance that, that was kind of real, well, was really off base. Um, you know, I, I think that Callan doesn't provide an answer for us, but what I think he does do, I think is he sharpens the question very effectively. And he, he makes us think about the condition of union as a condition not of having single-mindedness of purpose um, or the dominance of one particular point of view, but precisely in that, in the productive encounter with the other um, and the exchange of ideas, sometimes even the violent exchange of ideas, um, as long as underlying that is this, is this commitment to mutual benefit. Now, for me, I don't know that that mutual benefit, you know, that commitment is really there in American society. You know, he, he wants to believe it fundamental to what he's saying is that reason is, is, is you know, going to rule, uh, run, you know, reason is going to be the reason we um, follow through on this. But, but reason has not really been a big part of how American life has, has progressed in the last few years, right? It's, it's, 
we've seen emotion and, and passion um, uh, become dominant. So, you know, I, I, I don't, what I think that I would take hope for from in terms of his words is, is, is just that he is saying that that's not an inevitable state of affairs. That um, yes, this is happening, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's going to continue to happen um, we have to we have to fight we have to steal ourselves to have some optimism and promote that this idea of reason prevailing um, and and supporting each other all right other questions Gabe, Gabi Kende asks how influential were his thoughts and writings during his lifetime that is the million dollar question that I try to answer in my book um, because it's notoriously difficult to trace how influential someone's ideas are. I try to do it through tracing publication records, correspondence with editors and that sort of thing and get, get that idea out. Um, I think that his ideas had, they were, they were important, but not determinative. Um, cultural pluralism, what, you know, that became a part of the American lexicon by the 1950s um, over decades. So, but it wasn't because anybody directly referred to him. It was a gradual process. He inserted himself into it. Um, Reconstructionist Judaism, Mordechai Kaplan, we all know he founded that. And he created this idea of Judaism as a civilization. What isn't really recognized is that Kaplan's, Kaplan's idea of Judaism as a civilization is rooted in Callan's idea of what he calls Hebraism. Kaplan read Callan and in, in, you know, in the early in the 1910s and was very much influenced by him, but Kaplan didn't acknowledge it directly, but his influence was there. Um, Callan also influenced the direction of reform Judaism uh, un, under the radar, again, through connections through teachers um, at, at HUC. So we can trace that. So we know that he was having an impact. And the last piece I'll say about it is that Callan knew everybody who was anybody in America. I mean, he was connected, it was unbelievable. Like he knew presidents, he knew Supreme Court justices, he knew international philosophy. I mean, he, he was connected to the who's who list of the world. Um, so he, you know, we know that that had to have an impact as well. But it's a great question, it's a hard one to answer. Jack Schroeder. Given that Callan didn't much review the development of power structures in American society, what do you think he would have to say about the idea of reparations? Gosh, I haven't the foggiest idea what he would have to say about the idea of reparations. That's a great question. Um, hmm. I could develop an, uh, an argument around there in my head, but I just, uh, yeah, I won't pretend to, to have any wisdom on that. Um, that's a wonderful question. I certainly think a case can be made for him supporting it. I don't know. Um, Michael Singer, uh, do you think he was naive in his outlook? Great question. Um, you know, I don't think he was naive because he did live through, I would say probably worse than what we've lived through. I mean, he, he lived through literally two world wars. Um, yeah, so, and the Great Depression. Um, so he, he saw, you know, a lot worse. So I don't think he was naive, um, but he was determinedly optimistic. And, and I think his, it, what maybe he was naive is in, in the sense that he relied, he, he was overly trusting that America would be governed by reason. Maybe that was a naive piece. So that's a great question. Um, and that's a question that I'm asking all of us really, you know, um, is it just naive? Uh, do we have a prayer? Are these ideas things that we can continue meaningfully to strive for? Well, while we wait for another question, I have a, a, a quick question for you. Um, certainly you pointed out that he, was critical on Israel's um, use of force and things of that uh, uh, um, right. nature. But I'm wondering in, uh, in other dimensions, um, whether he compared kind of secularism of many Jews in Israel to his concept of secularism here and a somewhat separation between uh, you know, synagogue and state there. 
um, and some ideals of cultural plural. I mean, to what extent, I mean, many Israelis kind of point to the, the secular aspects of parts of its society. So I'm wondering, you know, I, since I don't know, to what extent he compared kind of that sense of secularism in both countries. I had, um... I, I had a correspondence recently with one scholar who's in Israel who is who made an excellent point. He, he said, you know, um, I'm not sure that cultural pluralism can work in America. He was very skeptical that it could work. And he's quite possibly right about that, that it might have more of a chance in Israel, um, which I found a very interesting proposition. Um, but if it has a chance there, it's certainly not happening there. Um, you know, it's, it's an ideal, uh, but not the facts on the ground, right? Um, I think that as far as, um, as far as Israel is concerned, he was very concerned with orthodox hegemony uh, over certain aspects of Israeli life. Um, that to him was anathema. Um, he felt that, that that couldn't stand. That was anti-cultural pluralism. Um, again, because we have um, not only not, not only violating this this you know separation of church and state, um, but it's also the privileging again of of one particular um, group's interests um, that leads then to the diminishment of the rights of others and the freedom of others. So that is highly problematic, and he would have he absolutely he decried that during his lifetime, and and you know, and it's it's an ongoing issue. Um, so yeah, I, I think that as far as Israel is concerned, it was it was a um, it was a he had, obviously he was a committed Zionist um, and was absolutely critical in establishing um, an American brand of Zionism, which was which was. I'm going to say defiantly cosmopolitan in its outlook, um, and it was very much not what Weizmann was doing, and not what you know he he broke with Weizmann in 1920s, um, along with Justice Brandeis, and and had nothing to do officially with the Zionist movement after that. Um, but he nevertheless he remained connected to two people, two institutions, including the Herzl Institute, which sent him to Israel on a mission in the 1950s. And he produced a book, Utopians at Bay, um, where he reflected on the current condition of Israel in his time. Um, but, and he said basically these similar ideas that, um, that it was, he, wanted, uh, he wanted Israel to adopt this. And as I say, he called it the Jewish idea, which to him was the same thing as the American idea. And they're the same thing because as I said, these are inseparable ideas in his mind, right? They, the one informs the other. So he feels that this is essentially what the Jewish idea, um, um, if it's divested of its religious interests, you know, that, that are then perverting it from its true Hebra Hebraism core, which is the culture of the Jewish people. That's what he sees as it's the foundation of Judaism, you see. It's not the religious belief system. He sees that as a layer the, what's prior in primary um, is Hebraism, the sum totality of Jewish life, which as a part of it has a religious aspect. Again, Kaplan, or Cal, or, yeah, Kaplan uses this in Judaism as a civilization. So he felt that that was what um, Israel um, should, uh, should adopt. Does, do Israeli, secular Israelis adopt a similarly tolerant pluralist outlook? I'm not certain. Um, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a question whether, whether Israeli brand of secularism, uh, you would know more about that than I, Yael, um, whether the Israeli brand of secularism um, has an ideological commitment to pluralism in some ways, uh, or whether it is reactionary uh, and, re and just rejects the sort of the religious point of view, perhaps. But you, you yeah, I think more. so many belong to that secular category that there's a lot of diversity within it. Right. Um, and those who are more for cultural pluralism and those that are less so, as I suspect is the case in the United States as well. I think we have two or three other questions that popped up. Um, so let's... Cal, Ken Bieber, did Callan's final days, death, and whatever was done regarding his body after dying comport with his public thought? Callan's final days and death... Um, okay, uh, now, uh, yes. Um, 
up until he died, he still was saying the things that I was talking about today. Um, he died surrounded by family at a, in a restaurant in, uh, I think it was in Florida. Um, he was active until the last minute. So um, he died as he, uh, that absolutely that was comporting with his public thought. He died fighting and assuming he was gonna just, he just continued fighting for life. Um, after as your question about what was done regarding his body after dying, Ken, is, is, is I'm afraid I can't answer that. I don't know, um, but I'm I'm sure that uh, that the that it would have followed um, his his desires. Um, I assume there would have been um, a traditional. Uh, well, I assume there would have been a traditional um, Jewish burial, but I don't know. Actually, that's a great question. Bernie Lightman says, I'm struck by Callan's idea of betting on democratic secularism as a form of faith. It reminds me so much of the famous wager in the French thinker Blaise Pascal's Pensee, which argued that it was reasonable to wager on faith in God. Did Callan read Pascal and perhaps derive this idea from him? Yes, Callan, um, Callan, was, uh, Callan would have read uh, Pascal 100%. Um, his, the breadth of his knowledge was uh, was inc incredible. Um, he was fluent in French and English and German and Yiddish and um, Hebrew and uh, and he read everything um, from antiquity on. There's just nothing he didn't read, basically. Um, so yes, it's very reasonable to suggest that he uh, was influenced by Pascal, um, but I don't know directly. Um, but yes, this, this idea of betting um, as a form of faith is, is certainly this, this idea of a wager. Um, basically, it means, it, it, I mean, I think what's important for him in using that term is that basically he's saying that you have different possible alternatives before you. So the, church, the alternative that you choose is not a sure bet is not a sure thing, right? That's why he chooses the term bet because it's different than traditional religious faith, which doesn't assume there are alternatives. There, it, it, you know, the, the traditional religious outlook is this is the right way. And this surely will lead to, to lead to redemption. And I think Callan always has an element of doubt in there. So it, the, the word bet I think captures that for him, recognizing there are alternatives and choosing this one. Steve Kale asks, did his viewpoint change on the Vietnam War as it progressed? Did he see communism as a form of secular religion like democracy? He did, okay, so I don't know about his viewpoint on, on the Vietnam War. I was hoping to find some more in the archives on that. And maybe they're out there, uh, but I haven't found it yet. Did he see communism as a form of secular religion like democracy? He did see communism as a form of religion. But, um, but he, yes, and, and it, it was secular, but it wasn't secularism in the same way that humanism isn't secularism, uh, in the same way that Marxism isn't secularism. These are, these were, um, uh, well, humanism will take me too far afield, that's a bigger question. But com the communism, um, Marxism, and any of these isms um, postulate a sure way to redemption, that this is the only thing, that this is the way to fix everything. Um, and I think he, he found them to be, I think the, the way he put it was they were compensatory dogmas. I think he saw communism as a compensatory dogma that, that, um, that we are, we are we, the, the present is terrible, but the compensatory dogma is that communism will bring about a redemption. Um, so it, it functions the same way as a traditional religion. I think he distinguished secularism uh, from, from other isms um, because, uh, because he didn't see it, that as a compensatory dogma. Myron Aronoff writes, and we could unpack that more, but that'll take us, uh, I think that would take a while. Um, Myron Aronoff writes, to what extent does Ahad Am's cultural Zionism compare with his notion of Americanism? So Ahad Am's cultural Zionism uh, was an, absolutely uh, an influence uh, on Callan um, as he developed his notion of, um, of, of, uh, 
cultural pluralism, of America, of Zionism. Um, Ahad Aan's uh, vision was uh, of cultural Zionism, as you know, also figured largely Mordechai Kaplan's. So they were all in, in, in a similar universe of, of discourse, absolutely. Um, so um, uh, let me, I'm, I would have to, I would have to revisit again Ahad Aam's cultural Zionism in more detail to, to get like, to get a more nuanced variation uh, from Kellen, um, but there is a great deal of overlap there. Well, I don't see any other questions. So thank you for a very stimulating and thought provoking talk. I don't know if you wanna leave us with any kind of uh, last um, thoughts, but uh, I think we have a lot to, to talk about, um, uh, continue thinking about and talking about after your talk. So thank you so much. Well, you know, I, I guess I, I really wanted to work through for myself where we are and, you know, what's going on with us in America now. And, um, and like everybody else, I'm looking for a way out, you know, um, and, uh, and so I, I look to this, to the writing of this guy for uh, as someone who, who felt he had a way out. He felt he had something to offer in this regard. Um, and, uh, and I just offered it warts and all um, for consideration. Um, and hopefully, you know, I think that, that his thoughts, yeah, they're in, in some ways, they're an artifact of his time. Um, but in some ways, I think that these ideas are not dead just, just because he's dead, just because the ideas were fashioned uh, half a century ago, um, there's, some, there's, there's something there to think about. There's something there to, to hold on to hope. Um, so I want to just leave everybody with the possibility of, of hope and uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity to present Callan's, uh, Callan's ideas to everybody. So thank you so much for this opportunity. It's just been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for the stimulating talk. And for those of you who'd like to start watching some of the Israeli films, you'll be able to start doing that in five days on uh, February 28th. And we have some links there for you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you.